Welcome to another video. So hopefully you're subscribed by now to the YouTube channel and possibly even become a Patreon to support us financially. Uh, token gestures or you know, small amounts once a month um, are really important to, to keep the association sort of turning over, making sure that all our costs are covered so we can start to really focus on delivering more in, you know, interactive content potentially or more adventurous content as well. So thank you for those of you that are supporting us already. This video is about the rangefinder. So the infantry rangefinder was an accessory that served with the Vickers machine gun right from its earliest days, actually just before. So the Bar and Stroud infantry rangefinder was introduced in March 1912, and it stayed in service right up until the early 1970s with the introduction of the laser rangefinders, albeit in embryonic stage at that point. So the infantry rangefinder, uh, as as it's named, you know, is different to the artillery rangefinder. As you'll see, they're sh quite short. They're 80 centimeters in length. The artillery rangefinder is one meter in length, and more on that will become clear uh, you know, as we progress through the video. The purpose of this video is to give you a general overview of the rangefinder and the accessories that go with it. A little bit about how it works, but what we want to do in the future, and one of those more adventurous videos that we'll do, is actually replicate the rangefinder training course. So probably from 1942, uh, the small arms training manual that exists from that date, we're going to run through with uh, some, some willing volunteers how the rangefinder works, um, and, and run through that whole course. What did range takers actually have to learn? So important uh, point in, in sort of terminology there, the range taker is the person, the range finder is the instrument. I'll probably get it wrong as we talk through the video, but hopefully you'll forgive me on some of those. So we'll talk through a little bit about the development of the range finder, the, the, its role as well. So let's, let's start with that, it's probably really key because these were used uh, not just for machine gun crews, they were used across mortar teams as well. Certainly as mortars progressed after the First World War, you'd see a range taker as part of the mortar team. But actually, even in the First World War, you had a range taker with a range finder as part of the um, equipment of an infantry company. There'd be one or two range finders, range takers, in the company to help calculate ranges to targets um, and to help sort of you know, prepare the company's defense or, or, or offensive actions. So quite an important bit of kit that wasn't just for, for machine guns, but certainly because it's in the Vickers MG collection, most people, you know, that's what we'll be talking about, but most people also associate it with the Vickers machine gun because it saw, uh, let's say, that presence throughout its service life. So let's go jump back a little bit before the infantry rangefinder comes into place. And one of the bits of kit we have here is a mechometer, M-E-K-O-M-E-T-E-R, a mechometer. This is a very rudimentary piece of, of kit, as it, as it would seem. This is only one half of it. This is the left instrument. You would have somebody else with the right instrument as well. And it's a number of prisms and these marks and you've got these little tabs here, are actually made so that you can um, put two people, and so it's a, it's a three-man team from what I understand. Uh, there's a little bit in this in some of the early field engineering manuals. So what you do is you put two people out to form this triangle um, for, for you to see. And you know, the person holding the left instrument looks to make sure he's lined up with the person holding the right instrument, and then there would, it would be a third person that sort of holds the string uh, and is able to work out then through a little bit of maths how far those two people are apart and how far um, looking through their, their lens or, or um, looking forward, they'll be able to see and work out ranges uh, using these people that are spread at quite a wide distance. Clearly, quite a cumbersome, when you, you know, small piece of equipment but quite a cumbersome arrangement to get uh, all these people uh, arranged. Um, quite quickly though, so this is, although this is 1915 date, it's still in use in the Great War, after that March 1912 date when the infantry rangefinder is introduced. And the infantry rangefinder, this is the number, it's worth saying the Bar and Stroud is the number two instrument. 
The number one was the Mandarin rangefinder. Very similar in appearance, so about the same length, um, you know, tubular arrangement, but the Mandarin quickly becomes obsolete. It's the Bar and Stroud that sits with the Vickers throughout. And we've never seen any reference to the Mandarin being used in the Vickers, so I don't really know too much about that one, um, but certainly it was in use with the Maxim, uh, Maxim teams. But the Bar and Stroud sits with the Vickers, introduced in March 1912, and follows it through its entire service life. So to talk about the, the rangefinder, just a, a useful sort of you know, quick uh, overview of what we've got here. Say so the number two infantry rangefinder. It will develop into the number 12. And the reason being, uh, to go back to terminology, is the number two infantry rangefinder, had a, there was also a number two artillery rangefinder to represent the Bar and Stroud number two. Um, as opposed to the Mandarin that they could use as well. Let's say it was a metre long, um, but it was still uh, at the number two. Later developments, uh, I think it's mid-1920s, see this change to the number 12 uh, for the infantry rangefinder. The number two remains an artillery instrument, but the number 12 uh, becomes the infantry model. So what have we got? We've got two eyepieces here, and then we've got two lenses at either end of this tube. Very simple mathematical terms or geometric terms. It uses trigonometry within a series of prisms in here to look through both of these lenses. It pulls up two images in this uh, right-hand eyepiece and then on the left-hand eyepiece you'll see a, um, a scale and also on the back of the instrument you have this scale here as well. Uh, so it can actually be read from outside of the instrument by by another person. So you could have the rangefinder operating uh, like so, and you'd have somebody laying in front of him, facing him, uh, to read this other scale if he needed to. But by adjusting the wheel here, you are able to effectively take the images, and you, you want something vertical in that image. Because what you want to do is get these two images, so your telegraph pole, ideal, tree, excellent. You know, you, what you're going to do is they're going to be offset, and you're going to adjust the, the prisms inside uh, and the mirrors inside the instrument using this wheel to align those two images. So you get a single line down the middle of, middle of the eyepiece. And what that then means is that is the range that you can read off in the, in the left-hand eyepiece. And then... Well, once is never good enough. So you need to reset that and do that a number of times and average out uh, your readings to be able to work out what the average um, of all of your readings is to be able to give the most accurate. The more measurements you can do by resetting the instrument, aiming off, re-aiming onto that uh, eyepiece, uh, onto, that, um, onto that target, whether you're a telegraph pole or tree, the more you can do of that, the better. So once is never good enough. Um, and let's say, what have we got here? Let's talk through some of these instruments as I hold them up. Um, this is the Mark III. So the Rangefinder Infantry Number no. 2, Bar and Stroud Mark III. Made by Bar and Stroud Limited, a Glasgow firm. Uh, 1917, this instrument. And what it is, is it, I put it on the shoulder here, um, just instinctively. But that's quite commonly when you're doing displays, is it a rocket launcher? Is quite a, you know, a normal question. No, it's not. It's too delicate for that. Um, it's mounted on its stand infantry uh, for you know, the number 12. So the, this is a, what we've we got here, a 1915 stand, um, you know, quite short appearance, can be used you know, to, to hold it. Um, it can be rested as well. And you'll see lots of different uh, sort of positions in the manuals of how the, this, this can be used, but it, it is quite a short arrangement. Um, and recently, you know, in promoting this video, somebody came up with a, um, a piece of equipment in their collection, which was a tripod that this fits in. Now, we're not sure about the, the, um, the sort of heritage of that. Uh, so it's clearly an old, you know, it's clearly a service item, but we don't know whether that is actually for the rangefinder or if it is. It certainly wasn't used with machine gun crews. It's not on any of the lists. Uh, there it may have been an artillery thing because these fittings you know, do fit artillery uh, rangefinders as well. Some are different, but yeah, this one, this one is. Um, some of these do fit. So you've got a 1917 instrument here in quite good condition actually. You've got little loops here, which we can see on 
uh, this instrument here hold the hold the sling uh, the, the, the strap so you can carry it a little bit more and then you can fold this little cover down and we've got a eye cover or a cover piece that if we turn the instrument we can put over there to protect our lenses you can then fold down this um, comes off been on display for quite a while now there we go comes off like that and you've got quite a compact little package so far but to protect the lenses you can turn these ends in as well and you've got this you know, say quite compact little package that would then fit into one of the covers or the cases um, to go, go through the instruments that we've got as well you know just a little bit further We've then got this uh, this one at the back here. Again, quite good, uh, quite good condition. I believe it's a Mark. It's also a Mark III. This one's 1916 date. It's a slightly earlier um, serial number, slightly earlier on that one as well. It's got the strap fitted. It's got its leather eyepiece cover. Not quite as shaped. Looks like the um, the end pieces have been taken out of this one uh, to make it easier to use. Uh, and then we've got this one here, which is a Mark III Star Star. There were actually six Marks um, up to 1942. So the, you know, the, the Mark I, II, the three seems to get modified to the, four, to the three star and the three star star. Uh, then you've got four stars and it works all the way through to the Mark VI. Most of those are in this similar configuration with the, with the strap here. Um, the difference with a Mark VI is the strap actually goes onto the ends of the rangefinder. Um, it doesn't have fittings for an eyepiece cover. Uh, it doesn't have a um, cover for the lens at the rear. It's a much simpler sort of wartime expedient affair. Um, it, 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 and it isn't mentioned in the 1933 manual, but it is in the 1942. So certainly introduced at some point during that period. Um, you know, or, or running up to the Second World War or in the early part of it. So, yeah, the Mark VI is slightly different. The, um, let's say the, the Mark III and then the Mark III Star Star uh, seem to be the commonest instruments. They're the three we have. Uh, but certainly, if anybody's aware of any of the other variants, we'd be interested in knowing about them and possibly acquiring them. Um, you know, this one here has a web cover or canvas, web and canvas cover rather than the leather, so that's quite interesting. It has a, um, same, the same uh, sling arrangement, but uh, you, you, th this different eyepiece cover. And then what you've also got uh, are these different uh, uh, sort of eye um, guards, really, that will fit over the eyepieces. This is obviously in a little bit more of a disrepair it's saw by rubber so it, it's gone hard and brittle whereas this is um a sort of different kind of uh, rubber uh and yeah we haven't got them fitted but you know, it's clearly a um just to protect the eyes if, if the head's rested there for some period so these exist for those um for them as well um uh, we've got a couple of different stands in the collection too so you know this is the the british service stand that exists uh, to start with, we're aware of this one as well, which is a much longer. Um, we're not aware of this in British service, but it seems to have been used commercially. So, yeah, that one uh, exists as well. Because Baron Stroud, obviously, like Vickers, sold their wares around the world. Um, the, the stand can be carried in a small leather um leather holder that will fit onto either yeah in the first it's made to fit an 08 pattern belt let alone a um you know the the, the smaller two inch uh pattern 14 equipment or the or the 1937 pattern so um you know that, that, that that's how it's carried it fits into the box in that in that case as well uh, fits in fits into the case in in the pouch um and then on this this one at the rear just to bring this forward a moment we have this, uh, the number 14 stand. So the number 14 actually allows for a much sort of wider use. Let's see if we can just get it set there. Um, sort of much more extendable. You, know, uh, you don't have to hold it, you can rest it on the floor. Um, it will actually extend out, one of these is pretty stiff, I know. 
Um, so let's see how far we go with it. Here we go. Or well, how I loosened it. No, I loosened the ball off. So that one will actually be something you can sit behind rather than having to lie behind and will remain remarkably stable. Or you can mount it, um, you know, it, it, it and stand behind it if it was on something as well. Um, interestingly, one of the other uses for this, they seem to have fitted them to uh, the tops of Churchill tanks at one point. So you know, we, I've seen some of the trials for that. I don't think it worked quite well. I think quite a lot of the prisms got knocked out of alignment and um, needed readjustment, but they, they did use them for, for that. So, um, yeah, interesting sort of diverse, diverse item there. But let's say, so you've then got this number 14 stand that was certainly in use in the, from um, the 1930s onwards. It fixes in the same way, and I'm gonna take it off because I'm not drop it. Because what I wanna show you is the, the cases, and the cases come up quite often. Um, so we've got a couple of cases in the collection. This is the Mark III uh, cover, number 12, rangefinder Mark III. And they're broadly the same as the Mark IV, certainly on the inside, but there's one major difference uh, on the outside of the case. So, so this is the, the Mark III, a little bit more scarce than the Mark IV. You've got these, this pad in here that you put the, the point of the rangefinder in, in, in there, and then you know, it sort of tucks into the ends. That's oh, quite a stretch for this one. So when people say their rangefinder won't fit in the case, you know, does it fit in by a couple, not fit in by a couple of centimetres, or does it not fit in by um, by twenty centimetres? If it's twenty centimetres, you've got an artillery rangefinder. Uh, there you go, it does fit, and then that will, that will go around that case there. Obviously, the stand in that case then gets carried on the strap. That's the only place to carry it gets carried actually on one of these closing straps or on the belt clear, you know, of the range taker. However, with the Mark IV case, you have this uh, on the back here. And when you have the Mark, when you have that, it means that you can actually fit the number 14 stand on the outside, because there's no pouch for the number 14 stand. Um, it just has to you know, be carried with the instrument all the time. So, let's put that. Uh, clearly you could sort of hang it over equipment or um, you know, carry it in a haversack if you were just carrying the instrument you know, loose, but much better to carry it in its case. We know this case has been used a few times. Uh, by us. So you've got to have it in this, you've got to have these eyepieces folded up for it to fit into the case. Um, then you've got some spare parts or uh, pockets in the case. You've got um, a lot of padding. This one is M&Co 1944 marked on the canvas. These are quite common. They're probably the most common, possibly even more common than the rangefinders. Um, so it, yeah, there's poppers on either end just to stop that, the case, uh, you know, Riding, riding up or riding open up one end, and then it's mainly secured by this popper in the middle. It's a bit tight, so I'm not going to worry about doing it too much. Um, and then these two half inch webbing straps at either end here. Now, what I'm just doing is that it's worth saying the range taker, as a member of the section, was. Uh, so it was in every section in the First World War, it was the number six, uh, worked with the scout, the number five, and they'd be carrying the instrument in its case, in its box, uh, in the limbered wagon. Uh, and there was a cover that they, they'd take it out of and be able to carry it forward, mainly to protect it from mud and grime, because uh, you know, it's a sensitive instrument. But then, in the sort of moving forward, you'd have one range taker and rangefinder for every two guns as the section is formed. 
Uh, so not one for every subsection, one for every section, every two guns, and they'd work with the section commander. So by the Second World War, the range taker was part of the section commander's carrier. Um, they were normally armed with a machine carbine, so a Thompson or a Sten, uh, rather than a rifle, uh, which means when you're looking at photos, you can actually sometimes identify the range taker because he's the one wearing the full basic pouches rather than the cartridge carriers. So you know, he's armed with a submachine gun. In the, in the First World War, um, or in the Great War, and, and before, from that 1912 period, they were actually armed with revolvers. Uh, and so you sometimes see on the equipment list, you know, range takers and pipers and drummers to be armed with revolvers. Uh, so, yeah, those guys are listed separately. But that's what they'd be carrying as their sort of bundle, really, um, of, of all of their equipment. So now we'll have a look at uh, the boxes uh, a little bit and um, you know, fit some of the items in the boxes there. So what I want to do now is just take the opportunity to show you some of the cases in a little bit more detail um, and how they're fitted out uh, and some of the differences. So this is a Mark II case. And one of the things that's really important to notice on a rangefinder uh, case or box um, is these, these white marks uh, that are on either end here. And then on the later boxes, they're actually on the inside and there's a leg uh, at the back here that this one's missing its, its latch, but means that you can, that the box can sit there and will sit upright. The reason for these, uh, and also the reason for these poles that sit inside of here, um, and these uh, fit on a, a slightly different model case, uh, they fit inside and, and hold, are so that you can create an artificial infinity. And you know, when we do the training videos, you'll learn more about that. But that means that you can test the rangefinder. You know, they will be 80 centimetres apart all the time, um, so that you can... You, you can fit them um, at, the, at this distance, that's 80 centimetres, so that it's in line with the lenses. And that creates this artificial infinity that means you can do adjustments on the rangefinder and you can calculate whether it's actually working properly. Um, so as I said, when you're, when you're fitting the rangefinder in the case, the, uh, the, the short stand um, fits uh, that way around. In, in there, I believe, that way. No, nope, that way round, sorry. So it fits in there. Fits in both cases, early and late. That's a random screwdriver head. Um, and then the instrument itself needs to be folded in the same way as it does to go in the cover. So, so yeah, so, so in term, terminology, we've got a cover and a case, not a case in a box. I sometimes get confused. Um, but yeah, the, the, we've got the cover and the case. So the, the, the instrument then sits, uh, we, we've got a strap there needing a bit of restoration um, on this one. So the instrument then sits in there quite happily, it should do, or is it the other way around? Um, both, both cases seem to you know, sit quite happily. No, it should be, my mistake. Take that back out, that, put in that round, that then, let's put that in that way. Yes, there we go. It's all a learning process. Fits in like that. And then these leather straps would be done up over the top of it. Um, you know, and it has this handle and this, uh, the, the clasp, uh, the, the latch there. So, so this one that needs to have a strap replacing, but that's how it fits into the case. And then the, the, the case would actually be carried, as I said, on the Limbered Wagon, the 1500 weight truck. Um, does it, I don't, uh, it does get a mention in the earlier, um, earlier, uh, that latch needs a bit of attention. Track range finder now. Um, so it does get a bit, uh, the case does get mentioned on, on the universal carriers as well. So that one's in there, fits in exactly the same way in there. Um, and you don't carry any particular spare parts with, with the, uh, in the case at all. Uh, you know, you make cleaning cloths and things like that uh, may be carried in, in the cover. Um, but there we go. That's a sort of brief overview, a broad overview 
of, of how the of how the range finder instrument works um, to hopefully you'll, you'll uh, want to join us uh, for watching the training videos as we put them together and one of these range finders actually needs a good restoration so the range finder that we've got over here needs uh, completely dismantling um, and we'll share that on video as well because the insides of these are, are quite complex actually um, and most of those changes in mar marks and modifications are also to do the number of mirrors and prisms that we've got inside. But we'll probably share the restoration of that uh, as, as we go through with it. Um, so yeah, please subscribe and you'll, 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 you'll get notifications then of when we put these rangefinder training videos and the restoration video uh, online. So there's the infantry rangefinder in service with a Vickers machine gun throughout its whole service life. I hope that's been of interest for you. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and share the video and subscribe to the channel. Please support us on Patreon if you're able to and let us know of anything you'd like to see in the future. I look forward to hearing from you.